Hello and welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. My name is Graham Arrowsmith. And my name's Kevin Appleby. So, Graham, how are your teeth? <laughs> um, well, um, I would say I give them a sort of like a B minus, but basically, um, if you really wanted an A plus plus, then you'd probably want to go and meet this guy. Is uh, I met Dan Walter in Orlando when uh, we were both attending a conference there. Um, and uh, Dan knows some of our uh, earlier guests. And um, I'm really delighted that we've got him up out of his bed at eight o'clock in the morning in Arizona. Um, he's, he's, he's been out all night um, uh, putting a few more uh, ballots into the uh, Maricopa County uh, 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 boxes that they have there. Um, anyway, Dan, welcome to the next 100 Days podcast. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning. Whatever it is, there. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored. And I should I should properly um, uh, describe you as Doctor Dan Walter because that's you're actually a, a doctor, aren't you? Correct. I actually have two doctorates, as it turns I mean, out. It, it just it just gets better. You've got yeah. two doctorates, but the thing about you, Dan, is that uh, is uh, you're a dentist now, so. Tell us a little bit about the dental practice that you run. Oh, wow. That could take up the whole hour. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I decided to open a practice in 2005 uh, after moving to Phoenix from Chicago. And I really didn't want to open my own practice. I really wanted to join a group or join another practitioner who was going to retire soon and slowly buy my way in and take over the practice. And I did that several times and I had a bunch of interviews and I met a bunch of people and I just couldn't find a practice that was run the way I, I would run my own practice. And so one day, my girlfriend at the time, who's also my hygienist, said, you know, we got to open our own practice. And I said, I don't really want to do that from scratch. I don't know anything about running a business. You know, you hear so many stories about small businesses going under in the first year. I mean, 80% are gone in the first five years. They run out of money. They have nothing but problems. And I really didn't go to dental school all those years and get all those extra degrees and do all that training to become a businessman. And really that, that is a challenge, Dan. I, I remember around the same time as you were opening your practice in Phoenix, then my wife was opening a podiatry practice here in the UK. And again, from scratch, you, know, yeah. you open your doors and on day one, you don't have any patients. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and I hear so many stories about, you know, people who are like, hey, I really like to cook. I think I'm going to open a restaurant. And being a good cook and enjoying cooking does not in any way prepare you to run a restaurant. So yeah. I was like, well, I'm a really good dentist and I love doing it, but I don't know how to run a business. But it just got so frustrating at some point. I said, OK, we got to do it. <clears throat> but luckily, I had about a year and a half to plan it before we opened in, two, in the June of 2007. So I just started reading a bunch of books. And there are, oddly enough, if you go online. There are hundreds of books written by dentists about how to run a practice. There aren't any about really how to open a practice. So I started uh, branching out after reading maybe 40 or 50 dental books about how to manage a practice and how to recruit employees and how to build insurance and how to present treatment and all that kind of stuff. So non which, which is all fine, all good stuff, mm. but, yeah, but it kind start. of implies you've got some patience. So yeah, exactly. ch ch challenge number one is how do you get patients into a brand new dental practice? So within a few months, I realized that I need to start reading business books and marketing books and other things like that and books on leadership and HR and goal setting and team management and things like that, which actually was very, very interesting. And I really enjoyed it. Surprising to me more than anybody else. I thought I would hate it, but I really kind of liked it. It was like going back to college in a whole new direction. And it was non-clinical and it's non-scientific, largely compared to like biochemistry and anatomy, physiology and all that other stuff that dentists are really good at. Um, suddenly they're talking about, you know, kind of softer skills like nonviolent communication and active listening and goal setting and things like that. So it was actually very, very interesting. And I pretty soon ran into a fellow named Dan Kennedy. And when I started reading his stuff and his, his associated people, it suddenly dawned on me that this is a group of people that think like I think this makes sense to me. And, and then I suddenly had courage and I had confidence and I said, let's do it. So then we still had about another year because we built a freestanding building and we built it all from scratch. And that took about a year. That took about 16 months, actually, to get in there. And so by that time, I had read at least a couple hundred books, not just dental, but a lot of marketing stuff. And I realized that when we open, we better have a full schedule because the overhead is going to be about 450 bucks a day. 
and I don't have any patience. So it's time to start building the schedule, which we did. Started marketing about three months before we opened and we were busy on day one. And all those gurus that said, oh, a dental practice takes two or three years to get profitable in your, in your loan, you better get an extra couple hundred thousand dollars to pay your staff and to buy supplies and equipment before you break even in two or three years. That all didn't actually happen. We were literally profitable on the first day and we were profitable the first month and we've grown every year since then now, 17 years. And it's been a blast. If you, also- if you, I, I'm just going to say, but if you look at where you're actually based, and this is something you mentioned to me when we were in uh, Orlando, mm-hmm. you're based in, first of all, you're based in Phoenix and you're uh, just a, a, a place, um, <clears throat> exactly the, the place name is Goodyear, isn't it? Goodyear. It was founded Which, in 1917 by the Goodyear Tire Company. Yeah, fact, I, I, okay. And so basically, to vulcanize rubber. So it's a factory town. It was. They're not here anymore. So it's good. You, like tire. Where you are, and one of the things you mentioned to me when, when we were chatting away in uh, uh, Orlando is that you're opposite a gated community of yeah. fairly affluent individuals. Correct. And um, what percentage is it of your business that comes from that gated community? Well, in the early years, it was over 90%, because that's the only place I market. I have very little online presence and I market heavily just to that one community. It's yeah. about 4,500 homes, uh, about 7,000 people gated, 55 and over, age restricted, and they're perfect <clears throat> for, for the type of dentistry I like to do. Um, now it's getting diluted more and more and more because friends and family of theirs come in and people they meet playing golf come in and people who walk by the practice come in and, you know, we're, we're in a pretty busy uh, mixed residential professional plaza with a lot of foot traffic. So it's probably about 80% now, but it, the, originally it was almost a hundred percent for the first few years. But just, just hold that thought though for a second within um, a relatively um, short drive of where you are, or, yeah, or you, you, walk across, you can take your, your, your life at your hands across the road, but basically yeah. get onto the side of the road. You've got this, you've got this gated community right. of just what you say, 4,500 Oh, Homes right. and about 7,000 people. They're, they're still building. They're going to end up being around 10,000 in a few more years. And yet that very small community, even, albeit affluent community, right. serves 80% of your, even now, 80% of your income. Yet the other 20% or the majority of, probably 80% of the 20% come from those people as well. Correct. Yeah, and that's not an accident. That is not an accident. They're, they're, no. That's the whole reason that I moved to this neighborhood. So well, you, you take that neighborhood um it's funny my wife and setting up a dietary practice together ended up in a in a fairly similar location and we marketed exclusively to that community which again was full of people probably slightly older but more more like 60 65 plus who would need attention to to foot conditions right. and it worked it worked a treat but no, I'd imagine in the dentistry field, most of those people you are going to attract into your business already had a dentist. So how do you persuade them to switch? (laughs) That's the dirty little secret that no one tells you when you're looking at demographics. Not only that, almost everybody already has a dentist, but there's a good number of people that never go to a dentist, 30, 40, 50% even in some neighborhoods, not in this neighborhood. This neighborhood is more prosperous. Uh, They're not in the top 1%. They're not super wealthy, but they're definitely all in the top 3 or 4%. They all, most of them have a separate home somewhere. They, they leave in the summertime, about half, <clears throat> you know, they still go have a house where the grandkids and children are, or where they're originally yeah. from. Um, and they go in the summer, just for those people who don't understand where Phoenix is. Yeah, it's, it's is it because it's, it's, it's a bit hot, isn't it? Yeah, it's very hot. It gets up into the high forties in June, July, and August. And wow. uh, the record temperature is 50 right on the nose. And we get close to that at least a couple of days every summer. That's pretty hot. And it's dry and everything's air conditioned. It's not that big a deal. It's still infinitely better than five or six months of winter everywhere else. Yeah. But, uh, you know, people who can afford it and who like to travel, they just get the heck out of here. Which they is go, They go north, presumably. It depends. Most of the people in, well, the people on the East Coast, like from New York and stuff, they usually go to Florida or Georgia or North Carolina, something like that on the East Coast. Um, Arizona draws people mainly from the West Coast and from the Midwest. In Minnesota and the northern states, Montana, Nebraska, that kind of thing. A lot of people from Chicago, St. Louis, Milwaukee, and then a ton of people from uh, Washington, Oregon, and California. Tons. And then, yeah, they just take off for three or four months in the summertime. Yeah, I I remember a road trip, actually, where, where we flew into San Francisco, went up and did Yosemite, and I was worried we weren't going to get out of Yosemite because of the snow. Right. And then we ended up flying back to the U.K. from Phoenix. 
Okay. And the contrast between worried about getting out of Yosemite in the snow and walking around in T-shirt and shorts in Phoenix was just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. the winters here are amazing. You got eight months where it's in the mid twenties during the day and around ten or five at night. It's winter time. It's it, just it was suddenly in February. It was what would rank as a very very good summer's day in the UK. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, <clears throat> been, up, been up to uh, Yosemite myself, and and um, we, we had to do a big curve around Death Valley because apparently it was flooded. Um, oh, yeah, it, 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 I suppose it occasionally happens, but the road road was washed away. So we we were yeah. going to uh, I think going to Las, Las Vegas, and basically we had to do a big curve around it. But it's right. interesting. Yeah, to the, the earth is so dry that the, if it does rain a little bit, it just sits there like a swimming pool. It doesn't yeah, sink in. Absolutely. But so you, I mean, first of all, so okay, day one, you're getting clients. Um, they're not necessarily top one percent, but they are. They're they're, they're wealthy. They're, 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 they're the mass. They're, then can yeah, they're, they're they're very they're able to afford your fees. But are you a general dentist, or do you have a specialism? No, I'm definitely a general dentist. I I have a focus. I focus on baby boomers and seniors exclusively. Yeah. I don't. See, I mean, you think about it, kids, especially in neighborhoods like mine. They, their teeth are fine. They're perfect. They never get cavities. They might need braces. They might not. And then that's it. And if you see 20 year olds and 30 year olds and 40 year olds, they really don't have any dental need. It's very rare that a 40 year old comes in and, and has, you know, a, a bombed out mouth and needs a bunch of crowns and root canals and extractions and bridges or implants or whatever. But people kind of 60 and over do. They still have dentistry in their mouths. A lot of my patients still have the original fillings they got in the 1940s and 50s in their mouths. And they're dreadful. I mean, they're really in bad shape. And they know it and they're like, that's time for a change. But getting back to your original question of why I'm in Goodyear in the first place, right about the time I was moving, it was 2005 or so, Forbes magazine every year has their list of the top 25 places to retire in America. And this is Forbes magazine now, the money magazine. This is not good housekeeping or a better home and gardens. And I read that list and number one was Goodyear, Arizona. And not only was Goodyear, Arizona number one, they specifically mentioned that neighborhood. So when Christine and I were thinking of moving down here, the first thing we did was go to that neighborhood and see how many dentists were in that neighborhood. And guess what? There were very few. And there were none right there, like literally where you can walk out of the front gate and be at the practice. And when you look into their newspaper, that's just for the community. And you look online of all the stuff that's going on there. Nobody was really marketing to them other than just your general, yeah, we have a general dentistry practice, come on by. Nobody had anything specifically that spoke their language or had an irresistible offer for them or had anything to do with baby boomers and seniors and the specific challenges and problems that they have compared to 20, 30 and 40 year olds. Yeah. So we looked at each other and said, well, this is crazy, man. This is ripe for the picking. So once I started reading marketing books and leadership books and business books, I said, this is going to be pretty simple if we do this right. And it turned out exactly that way. We just marketed heavily, uh, strictly to that neighborhood, had no online presence at all because I didn't want anybody to find me when they searched for me if they didn't fit my demographic. And I still am that way. I have a really nice website, but I don't market it at all. I do zero SEO because my website really has two functions only. One is if somebody hears about us or gets a flyer or reads my newsletter or sees me speak at, a, at a, an event or sees me sponsoring one of their charities in this neighborhood, and I have a pretty high uh, visibility in that neighborhood, a, a high recognition, then they can go to the website and learn more about me to see if I'm a good fit. And just as importantly, if someone's searching for a dentist, and they don't fit what I'm looking for, I want to repel them as much as I can. You know, I can't have a practice that's efficient if I'm seeing everybody from toddlers to 100-year-olds. That's just a tough way to run a business. And in dentistry, that's unusual. If I was a car mechanic and I specialized in Jaguars only or in BMW, nobody would think twice. They'd say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But in dentistry, that's pretty rare, unless you are a real actual specialist like an endodontist or a periodontist or an orthodontist. And so for me to say, well, I'm kind of an expert at baby boomers and seniors, that's a focus. But if I use the word specialist, every dentist in my neighborhood is going to take me in front of the board and I'm going to be in trouble because that's not a recognized specialty. But it is in my mind because <laughs> it's a different kind of practice. Any, any, anything that niches you down to a subset of the overall market is specializing. Correct. Yeah. But you can't use the word specialist in medicine unless you actually are a specialist. Mm. So in medicine, generally, if you're a cardiologist, you can say, yes, I'm a specialist. I'm a heart doctor. Yeah. But if you see people over 50, there's no specialty for that. You can't just say I'm a specialist. No. Yeah. 
Right. But, I mean, I, I suppose you could, to my patients, but I can't say to my advertising. I suppose, you, I I suppose you, know. you could have a quiz on the front door, though, couldn't you? And it, you, you know, I mean, and, and you'd relate it back to 1970s TV. And if you can't, if you can't get the right answer, then sorry, you know, go, go down the road. So yeah, I mean, people walk in just because they walk by and they go, oh, "This looks like a nice place," and they don't fit my demographic or my ideal patient avatar at all. And I don't turn them away. Yeah. But I can see that, I mean, you can't make a living on 20 and 30 and 40 year olds, not anymore. You could two generations ago or one generation ago, but anybody born after, let's say, 1990, their teeth are perfect. I mean, yeah. perfect. And Unless what, why is that? Why, why well, could you make a living in the past, but you can't now? What, what, what's the change going on? Because when we were kids, we needed a lot of work. I had a bunch of fillings as a kid and I needed those replaced in my 30s and 40s. But Not why, why aren't the current generation getting that bunch of fillings? Oh, well, there's a lot of reasons. The first is fluoride. The second is regular care and preventative care. Yes. Sealant, professional cleanings and x-rays to find things really, really early. We're really good at finding cavities now that are even too small to see with the naked eye sometimes. And yes. fixing it in a very conservative way. And in a way that lasts a lifetime. You mm. don't have to get fillings replaced every 20 years or 15 years like it used to be. I must admit, I'm convinced that half the fillings in my mouth are there because of a dentist who wanted to make a lot of money and I didn't need them in the first place. <laughs> I hear that a lot. I can't imagine that happening, but I hear it a lot. Yeah, yeah. everybody thinks that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I suspect mine were all truly deserved. I mean, I, it, I had a bit of a sweet tooth and I, and I, I suspect my um, my teeth reflected that. But, um, you, yeah, but even all... toothbrushes and toothpaste and everything are better. Yeah. You, know, you, you get a nice electric toothbrush and 90% of your problems just go away. Mm. I've got to say, since I've... Oh, and, and kids, at least in America now, Probably 75% of them are getting braces to straighten their teeth, not for aesthetics, but for better air, better force distribution, a better comfortable, more comfortable bite. So there's proper wear and tear on the back teeth. They don't wear out in your 50s and 60s. If they get a feeling it's really, really small and there's still lots of healthy tooth structure around it to support it. Yeah. And, you know, they, they get regular care. Mom and dad care more about uh, oral health now. And they take them to the dentist twice a year and they just, nothing happens. And if it does, we catch it immediately and we fix it and it lasts. It's easy. So there's still plenty of dentists that, that see that demographic specifically, but for me, it's just boring. It's not exciting and it's not fulfilling. You know, it's nice to, to fill a little cavity on a 30 year old, but you know. Uh, I, I get that. Ah, not the kind of dentistry you, I enjoy. you just presented, yeah, your mouth, your mouth's a mess. Now we've, we've got a problem or two here. We've got to solve. Let's work out the plan of how we're going to attack that. I, I, I can, I can see that from your point of view, that it must be much more interesting work. Oh, much more interesting. Yeah. That's the most fun part of all is the diagnosing and trying to treatment plan. Yeah, especially if it's going to be complicated and it's expensive. And there nowadays there are so many options. I mean, even something simple like I'm missing a tooth. How do I replace it? Well, in the old days, you wouldn't replace it. And maybe if you were lucky in our grandparents' age, you get a partial denture or something that goes in and out. But now you can get a bridge or an implant. And uh, there are big differences between those. And there's big differences in money as well and time and effort, you know, longevity. So it's kind of fun to talk to people and kind of see which way they want to go and figure out what they want and what they need and give them a solution. And then when it turns out, even better than they thought, that's the best thing in the world. You um, mentioned earlier um, about marketing and learning about marketing. And I met you at a marketing conference. Um, and um, tell us a little bit about the kind, I mean, first of all, we, we overlap a little bit in terms of our previous guests, some of the previous guests that uh, people might remember. Um, people like Adam Witte, Sean yes. Book. Uh, Sean Book was about retention. Adam was about um, authority. Right. And we had other people from the GKIC network. Um, tell us a, a little bit about your style of marketing to that particular audience. Oh, good. One of my favorite topics. <laughs> well, the first thing you do is look at all the dental marketing that's out there, and it's all totally generic. You could take any. So I live in a neighborhood. I get two or three postcards in the mail from dentists every week myself. And I look at them, and I literally, if I crossed out the name, they would all be totally interchangeable. You know, things like, oh, we'll see the whole family and we'll take your insurance and we'll do everything in house and we'll customize a treatment plan and we have financing options. And uh, my favorite is we've been in the same location 20 years and we really care. And I always think, is there anybody in the history of the world that's, hey, Susie, there's a dental practice here that's been in, in, our, in our neighborhood for 20 years and they really care. We should go there. They're probably really good. I mean, who even comes up with those ideas? And there's always a happy, smiling family with palm trees yeah. in the back beach or they're on skis in the mountains you know everything you've mentioned there it's all about them the you haven't mentioned a single thing about the patient or what problem they might have in, in right, it. Right, right. 
So I, I learned early on in the, in the first couple of books I read, thank goodness that the first few I read were really good, like Seth Godin and Dan Kennedy and a few others that are just brilliant. And uh, I said, all right, we're going to focus on, on the patient. So the first thing is we focus on baby boomers and seniors. We have a practice just for you. That alone should have already been enough to fill my chairs. Because yeah. again, I always make the luxury car analogy. If you've got a Jaguar and there's something wrong with it, and it's a high-end Jaguar, are you going to take a Billy Bob's shop or are you going to go to the Jaguar place that only does Jaguars? Well, obviously, As a Jaguar owner, I might disagree with you there. Yeah, I've heard you talk about that in the past. But okay, you know what I'm saying. I'll, I'll find somebody who will give me a perfectly good set of new brake, brake shoes and discs yeah, but right, yeah, that's that's Jaguar all. prices for them. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. But, you know, the higher up you get, if you have a Rolls Royce for sure or an Aston Martin, it gets harder and harder for you to go away from a specialty garage. Yeah. It's kind of the same thing with healthcare. Folks in their 60s and 70s and 80s, they've already got a dozen doctors. They're not just seeing their general practitioner for all their problems. They've got a cardiologist and an ophthalmologist and a kidney specialist and maybe an internal medicine guy. And they already know what it means to have a place that's focused specifically on them because it's so specialized now and there's so much technology involved that not everybody, I mean, even if I wanted to do everything, I would have to spend another three or $400,000 just on equipment to see younger people and to do more specialized things for them because mm -hmm. I don't need that equipment, you know? And same thing with root canals, for instance. I mean, now with lasers and ultrasonics and microscopes, you know, you want to do a root canal at the same level that an endodontist does. It's really, really difficult. You need a whole room dedicated just to that. But anyway, getting back to the marketing. So we said, you know, first of all, your challenges and problems are different than when you were 20 or 30 or 40. That's obvious and certainly different than when you were a child or an adolescent. And you're looking for a practice that's quiet, that runs on time, that doesn't have a bunch of screaming kids in the reception area, that focuses specifically on what you do. That's uh, that doesn't go uh, that doesn't kowtow to your insurance limitations and restrictions because we're only a network with one insurance company and we, we're, we're fee for service. So people pay out of pocket uh, about 65, 66 percent of our patients. I couldn't say no to the big one because that's the biggest one in Arizona. But I was lucky that it was early enough that I could negotiate my own fees back then. So I'm not taking a very big cut there, which is nice. Um, and we're going to focus on comprehensive care. That's another big one. We're not just going to do one tooth at a time. We're going to look at everything. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do it, but we're at least going to diagnose it and, and present it to you and see if that makes sense. We're going to be super high tech, but still high touch. And all the things that really nobody else talks about. And then the, the really big one for me was a heavy focus on what's called periodontal medicine or the oral systemic connection, how oral health affects general health and how general health affects oral health. And nobody really talks about that which is crazy. And then we also talk about, you know, sterilization standards and using only high-end labs and materials and only FDA approved products, which everybody else does also. They just don't talk about it. You know, it's like when a restaurant tells you about how clean their kitchen is. Well, that's great. I'm sure they're all clean, but nobody ever mentions it. So it's a, it's a nice USB. It's something unique and different that gets people's attention. And it's a pattern interrupt. And my marketing was old fashioned and ugly and black and white with no white space and lots of text, no photos. And it just kind of stood out and people were like, what is this ugly thing? But at least it gets read. So I mm -hmm. still do that. All my marketing looks like I did it myself on the computer because I did do it myself. On the computer. I don't have a graphic designer and I don't have fancy pictures and it's not color glossy. It's black and white and it's text heavy. And it looks like direct mail out of a catalog from the 1950s. So it gets people's attention, at least my people's. Attention. And just, just let me understand something here. You're, you've got a full practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. You used to fill it completely from the community. You've now got an extra 20%, which is all referrals yeah, we're to you people. without much effort from the community. Okay, so you're doing very nicely. You've got this marketing messaging sorted out. What on earth are you doing sitting at a marketing conference in Florida? Oh, I enjoy it. It's fun. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. It's, it's psychology. And ultimately... All businesses work on psychology. It's human to human interaction. Yeah. I think it's interesting. And I, I just like the, the psychology of it. And I like writing and I like being creative. And it's just a nice compliment to doing clinical dentistry, which is also very challenging technically and also very creative. But it's just a nice use of the other half of my brain most of the time. I like it. And I like people who are who are at those conferences because they all have interesting insights about business that they love to share. And I, one, of the, one of the things I found myself is that uh, one of the one of the more successful postcard campaigns I did for a fine wine business was was based on a um, uh, an advert that was probably getting on 50, 60 years of age. And uh, 
I can't remember exactly when it happened, but it was the I when I sat down at the piano and it was that. Oh yeah. yeah. Now I don't know. It, it might have been hundred years ago, but it was a long time ago. But basically, fifties. Cables, old. I think. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's John Cables. Cables, Cables. Cables. Yeah, John J John Cables. But basically, a kind of did a, a theme of 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 the, 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 similar to the Cables uh, drawing, but it was a draw my drawing to do with fine wine, etc., and um, people with wine glasses. But then it was very copy rich, right? And um, um, and that had it had it, had probably the best campaign that I, I, I've run. For, you know, certainly for that client, and and from that point of view, there's some, and it was black and white. So basically, it was these are very deliberate choices because, as you were saying, Dan, that basically everyone else is going in a different direction, right. and you know that is so important when you want to stand out, particularly to your. Uh, first of all, the, the 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 boomers and baby boomers will read more. Yes, and and so Especially therefore it's and and it and so therefore you're catering to people that you want and, so, and the affluent uh, boomers and, and, and uh, baby boomers are probably even more likely to read so from that point of view it's an absolutely perfect strategy for those people so i mean do you do things like magazine advertising i mean you mentioned a magazine that goes to that particular community presumably you do um not in the magazine but they have a newsletter i mean a newspaper a full-on you know yeah, 100 yeah. pages or something that comes out monthly and I've written an article in that since day one. Every month I've written an article. I'm up to about 185 or something now. Wow. And it focuses very heavily on things that other dentists don't talk about. I don't talk about crowns. I don't talk about tooth bleaching. I talk about disease. I talk about oral cancer a lot because wow. that people motivated, especially over 60, 70. Everybody yeah. knows oral cancer is on the rise. It's more deadly than it's ever been. It's the only cancer that hasn't had an improvement in cure rates in the last 50 years. In fact, the death rate's 20% higher now than it was one generation ago. So that gets people's attention, not 20 year olds, not 30 year olds, but certainly people our age and older. Yeah. Uh, I talk a lot about oral systemic health, how gum disease gives you a three times more likely chance to have diabetes, for instance, three times more likely to get arthritis, three times more likely to get pneumonia, two, over two times more likely to have a fatal heart attack or stroke at a younger age in your 40s and 50s, more than double the risk. All you got to do is come in and get your teeth fixed and get your gums healthy and all that goes away. Plus about 60 other very strong connections between poor oral health and poor overall health. And I talk a lot about longevity and how people with healthy mouths on average live seven to 10 years longer than people with unhealthy mouths. And there are hundreds of studies that show that. And by the way, that's the same difference between smokers and non-smokers, seven to 10 years. That's a big, big difference just because you don't floss or just because you don't get your teeth cleaned regularly or because you're missing too many teeth and you can't eat properly. So that's my message. And I write about that all the time. And I also run two ads in that paper every month and they kind of rotate. But the big thing really is the article. And then I have a newsletter. I mean, a, a full on print newsletter that Sean uh, Buck talked about. And I, I'm still a subscriber to his newsletter, by the way. And uh, that's an ugly black and white text rich <laughs> uh, newsletter in which I don't talk about dentistry, by the way. There's yeah. one dental article in there that's kind of a summary of what I talked about in the article in the newspaper that month. And that's all about what we're doing at the practice, what courses I've taken, what technology we've added, uh, it has testimonials. It's got some quotes. It's got a joke. It's got things about healthy eating. It's health focused, but it's very li very light on dentistry. And, and I get literally every single day someone talks to me about that newsletter. Presumably, some uh, uh, that thing behind you, um, the guitar, that features a bit. Oh yeah, I talk a lot about music, concerts I go to, uh, bands I like. Yeah, I go to so, a lot of concerts. And I'm we're in the fifth largest city in the U.S. with a couple of big universities, so a lot of bands come through here. Yeah. which is nice. Yeah, I talk a lot about music. I have a little bit of a rock and roll persona going at work. And I got yeah. long hair, obviously, and I listen, we listen to rock music and I put on some Led Zeppelin or Black Sabbath, yeah. which is kind of nice in the evenings. Do you, do you, do you have that blaring away when somebody's in the chair? Presumably not, because you don't depends want to have it. Is. Yeah, I, it depends who it is. If it's yeah. a rocker who says, oh my gosh, I love when you write about music. I remember being at Woodstock when we crank out some whatever, you know, put on some mm -hmm. Hendrix or something or some Rolling Stones. Uh, I can, I can, we have different music in the rooms and we can do whatever we want. Usually it's a very quiet, small like atmosphere. I try to be the complete opposite of medical practices and hospitals. Their model of patient care and hospitality is horrible. I try to be more like a nice high end hotel or high end restaurant or high end spa. Everything we do is really based on the hospitality industry, like the Four Seasons Hotel or something like that, the Ritz Carlton. And we try to get as far away from the medical model as possible. So when people come in and they're expecting, you know, name, insurance, Sign in. We don't do any of that nonsense. 
none of it. We have a nice wide open waiting area with only one or two people at a time because I work one person at a time. I spend my time. We don't, you know, jam five people in at the same time. It's quiet. It's calm. Well, and we're really, you, really. Quiet. You have a, a really beautiful uh, a practice manager called Eva. That was great. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I'm 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 going to name it Eva because I I, I, okay. I I met somebody with the same name. And, and, okay, and, great. But she basically is Polish, and she and um, but I mean, presumably she kind of greets people on the way in. Is that part of what she does? Uh, kind of. Sometimes yeah. depends who's up there. I have two gals at the front desk. Okay. But the yeah. the it's just a different experience. It literally, we try to treat people like they're coming to our house. If a stranger came to the house, I had somebody coming over at four o'clock on a Tuesday. I wouldn't just let them walk in yeah. and go waltzing around looking at where to go. I would get up. I would go greet them. I'd shake their hand and say, hi. Chelsea. In this case, it'd be Chelsea. I'm yeah. Chelsea. We talked on the phone. You're Ch and we treat them by name, even if we've never seen them. I know at 12 o'clock, a new patient's coming in. It's a male who's 65. I see somebody walking in. We have big windows. We can see them walking through the parking lot. If a man who looks 65 is walking toward us around noon, it's Jim or John or Joe or whoever it is. Get up and say, hi, John. And you should see people's faces when you mention them their name and they've never met you before. You're like, oh, hi, Susie. Welcome to the practice. I'm Chelsea. We spoke on the phone last week. I'm so happy you're here. And if you go around the desk and you shake their hand and you offer them something to drink, they're already just shocked. They don't even know what to say. And they're like, do I have to sign in? You're like, no, I, I just talked to you. I know you're here. I don't have to have you sign this little clipboard with a piece of yarn on it with an old pen and that somebody's had in their mouth and you're going to sign a list. No, you're here. I'm going to mark you as present. And then we give them a little tour of the practice and we explain things and we help them with their paperwork. And by the time they get to meet me, they've already heard my name at least a dozen times. And they've seen me a million times at various golf tournaments or charities or health fairs or lectures I give to their various groups in that community. And they've been getting my newsletter for years. And literally it's, it's just the craziest thing. They're excited to meet me. Yeah. And all the sales work and all the trust and the credibility and the authority and all that stuff has already been done before I even meet them. And most patients who meet me say something like, I, I've been eager to meet you. I've heard so much about you. Or here comes the man who walks on water. You know, that kind of stuff. I get those kind of jokes all the time. And then it's easy. You listen. And I don't know. I mean, I could talk literally an hour about the new patient experience and all the things but, we do yeah, that no yeah. one's ever done for me. What you've, what you've done, Dan, is, is you've probably amazed our listeners. Because it's so simple, but I oh, it's to say, well, simple as in as in, no, it's, it's simple. not rocket science that you've, but it's just simple, clever ideas that you've implemented, and um, it's the sort of thing that it's that idea that you are because Dan Kennedy talks about this about you, you, I mean to get in touch with Dan Kennedy, you've got to send him a fax, right? You know, and then there's a long curation oh, period. Say so goes through the then his assistant goes through all the faxes. Oh, yeah. Takes the ones that are relevant and sends them in a box to him in Cleveland. Yep. And uh, the rest go in the trash. And then it's two or three weeks before he gets to them. And yeah, you got to wait, man. And if you're lucky, you're in the one or two percent he responds to. But I'm not Dan that. Kennedy. You're Doctor Dan. So basic, same ideas, but same ideas, similar ideas, well, but but not quite as extreme. Maybe not. But, yeah, but, but even something as simple. I mean, when I go to the dentist, I still have a dentist. Right. Some, so the first thing is, I'm sitting in the reception area, and there's three people there. And even though I've been going there forever, the, the assistant comes out and she looks down at the paper and she goes, Dan, Dan. And she looks around like she doesn't know who I am. That could never happen to my practice in a million years. I don't care if there are 20 people in the reception area. We know the guy in the red shirt is Joe. The guy sitting in the corner reading Time magazine, that's, that's, that's William. The gal over there with the big black purse, that's Susie. So look at the chart and figure out who's sitting out there and then go out there and make eye contact and say, Hi, Julie, we're ready. Come on back, please. That alone is, is worth, a, a, that's a writer downer, as Dan would say, right? It is. And then something as simple as, how do you seat the patient before I come into the room? If I haven't met them yet, normally, you sit them down, you put the bib on, you recline the chair, you turn on the big light, and the doctor walks in. He's got his mask on and his glasses, and he puts his gloves on, he sits down, he's leaning over, and he says, hi, Joe, I'm Dr. Williams. Nice to meet you. How can I help you today? And you've already lost. It's already over. They already don't like you. So we're like, don't put the bib on. Don't lean them back. Make sure that their chair is higher than mine a little bit. So when I come in and I say hi and I shake hands and I sit down where I level or I'm slightly lower. And let me just chat for 15, 20 minutes, sometimes 30, 40 minutes. My new patient exam is an hour with me. And I, I don't make any money on that. That's like 30 or $40. That's supposed to be a five-minute check. 
I spend at least 30 minutes just chatting. Where are you from? What do you do? What are your long-term goals? And I ask people questions that blow their mind. They never have had, has anyone ever asked you what's most important about your mouth and oral health? How do you want your teeth to be in the next 20 or 30 years? No, of course not. Does anyone ever ask you, what did you like about your last dentist? Why did you leave? Does anybody ever ask you, what are you looking for in your relationship with me? What's most important? No, but I do. And then they're like, uh, you can see the wheels going, I don't know. I never really thought about it, but they're really happy I asked. And then whatever they say, I want to keep my teeth for a lifetime, or I want to be able to chew when I'm older, or I want to have a nice smile. That has to be written down because every time I present treatment, even five years from now, I can say, well, as you told me when we first met, you want to be able to chew really well when you're older. And the best way to do that would be with X, Y, and Z. Or the same treatment, as you told me years ago, you want to keep your teeth for a lifetime. The best way to do that is X, Y, Z. I mean, that is like the easiest thing in the world. I keep extensive notes on everybody's personal history, where they're going, what cruises they're on, what their grandchildren are doing. Of course, that only helps you if a moment before you go in, you look at that list again. Yeah. And from six months ago, I'm like, hey, Susie, last time I saw you, you were going on a cruise. How did that go? And they're like, wow. And they know I write it down. I'm not a genius. I don't have a photographic memory, but I care. And there's a lot of love and joy in our practice and it shows. And that's really our superpower. I don't, about you. I don't know about you, Kevin, but it makes you want to go and live in Phoenix. Doesn't it? Oh, it does. <laughs> Yeah. Just at, at least part of the year, just to get your teeth. Done. Phoenix is great. Phoenix is great. But it, you know, it, it'd have to it'd have to bone up on things like um, you call it soccer, but we call it football. But basically, yeah, yeah. you'd have to know what who Newcastle United is. Or, or oh, I know who Newcastle is. They're doing really well right now. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, yeah, sorry about your Leeds boys. Yeah, yeah. Well, what can I say? Well, we're not doing that bad. Oh, yeah, we are. But yeah, um, yeah. but but I have to say though, um, uh, everything you've said so far really resonates. I mean, because we yeah, because you and I like Dan Kennedy, and we all kind of think the same way. Mm. Yeah, and that all comes from him and and his disciples. I mean, there are dozens of other people whose books I've read and lectures I've gone to who are influenced by him. In fact, the first probably ten dental books I read about written by dentists about how to open a, a practice and run a practice, they all quoted Dan Kennedy. Every single one of them. That's how I found him in the first place. I was like, who is this guy? Well, I've got to say. If you had to, it, it, we've talked about bringing in your, your ideal audience. You've talked about how you greet them. You've talked about, um, you know, effectively who you repel, who you want more of. Is there any other marketing tip that you would give, not just to dentists, but to other business people that you've learned from your business and growing your business? Is there anything else that you would offer as, a, as advice, as something don't miss out? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm going to take a moment on that one. Um, I'll go with back with uh, Cialdini with commitment and uh, with consistency and commitment. Just be consistent. Don't be wishy-washy. Don't change who you are based on who you're talking to. Yeah. Be the same. So yeah. every patient that comes in, I treat them the same, whether I think they want treatment or not, whether they're belligerent or not, whether they're super receptive or not. Even if they say, I'm just here for a tooth cleaning, I'm not interested in anything else. I don't care because I have an ethical and a fiduciary and a legal responsibility to treatment plan and tell them what's wrong. And then I can tell them, I say, look, my job is to inform you and give you my best opinion as an expert in this field. And your job is to decide if you want to do that treatment and you can do all of it. You can do some of it, some of it, you can do none of it. You can have someone else do it. That's totally up to you. And I literally don't care. I yeah. literally don't care, but I have to at least feel like I've given you the right information that if you want to have a great, healthy mouth, you want to have a great smile and you want to be functional when you're 80 or 90 or even 100. This is what you should do. And uh, yeah. And then if people are turned off by that, that's totally fine. I don't mind. Or people are, you know, belligerent about it. And like, I told you not to talk to me, then I'll be happy to dismiss me. But I think the key just is to be consistent and be yourself. And, and that took a long time to realize that I can design a business around who I am and what I believe in and not the other way around. Yeah. No, you know, you, you take that approach, Dan, and you can apply that to just about any business. I and mean, Graham, that you've got to apply to your business. You know, you've got people coming to you to say, "How do I take my product and market yeah. it to the affluent?" And, and just you like would just, them in the same way, absolutely same, same approach every time. Whether they decide to follow that up, buy the service, buy it from somebody else, do part of it, whatever. Well, it, it's it. I mean, it does sound a little bit sort of arrogant, but basically, it's something that Dan Kennedy said. God, God knows when I heard it, but basically, it was it's, if I give you my best shot for forty-five minutes to an hour, don't don't. For me, I'm not chasing you. Mm -hmm. right. You know, and inevitably they come back. Now, I think maybe 
I should chase people. But, you know, I think if Kennedy was on this call, he'd probably say, well, well hold on a minute, Graham. It doesn't exactly mean that. But, but at the end of the day, if at the end of that, you're not convinced by me, and we've talked about your business and how it can help your business, et cetera, and what I would do and the mm -hmm. benefits, and it's not right for you, then, you know, why should I chase you? No, so um, you know that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. It's not it's, completely it's, the same as Dan. That's if you do get in that chasing position, is that ever going to be a good relationship with that particular client? I'd suggest it would never be a good relationship. So why not walk away from it straight away? Right. Yeah, well, you want to be a fisher and not a hunter. Yeah. yeah I mean, people you're like not necessarily person. walking yeah. away from it, Kevin. I think what you're doing is it, and, and, and in very why it's last at this, because basically they go away and then they'll circle back round. They'll right. they'll come back know. around and, and yeah 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 that, that, that you know I've, 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 I've and they'll say and they'll sort of act surprised that they've come back and sort of <laughs> you know they're all welcome it's just basically on my terms yeah. but I I have to say um, meeting you was an absolute chance um, and you know what? Um, but well, we only it, had like five minutes or ten minutes maybe we did yeah. but I nice. knew straight away you were ideal for this because you have so much wrapped into this business of yours that is so relevant to so many other businesses. That's, that's why I wanted you on the podcast. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting how much confidence and courage it takes to build something that's different and to know that in a town of 102,000 people, I'm probably going to only market to a few thousand, which happened to all be in a nice little, little, little nest altogether, which is nice. But it's kind of scary. And, uh, you know, the hardest thing for me really was to become immune to criticism during that time. And I go back to Napoleon Hill, who said in, in his famous, you know, think and grow rich, the number one people, the number one reason people fail in life, not business, but life, is they listen too much to their friends and neighbors and family because they don't know what the heck they're talking about when it comes to business. And re regardless, I mean, if you're talking to the top 1%, sure, you got you listen to what they have to say. And that was hard because every time people like, oh, you're opening a practice, tell me about it. And I was talking about it. They're like, you're crazy. You're never going to make it. You need, you know, you need to draw from a much bigger pool and you need to see the way to have a successful business is to target mothers because then mothers bring in their husbands and they bring in their kids and they bring in all the neighbors and all the friends from school. They all come in. I'm like, yeah, that's true. But I don't want to do that kind of dentistry. That bores me. I don't find that interesting at all. And with all the advanced training and stuff I've got, I want to do complex restorative care, really big, fun cases that are challenging and take months and months and months to complete. Now, I don't do that every day. I still do the one, you know, I do a filling here and a crown there and a root canal there. I mean, I still do regular bread and butter dentistry, but I attract enough higher end clients every month to really make a difference financially and in, in our personal satisfaction. And my team likes that. Well, you know, honestly, trained, motivated. We, we, we could talk until it's lunchtime in Arizona, but we, we really have to um, uh, uh, draw things to a close. Um, right. uh, Dr. Dan, Dr. Dan Walter, you have been an absolutely uh, a brilliant guest on the next 100 days podcast thank you it's been a privilege it's been an honor it was really fun great to meet you guys thanks a lot so so many things that we've talked about over the years on the podcast all coming together in you know not an online business a fairly traditional bricks and mortar business now, there have been dentists around for, for the last 150 years mm -hmm. okay they've moved on because the technology's changed and the things they're able to do change they're no, no longer just people that'll pull all your teeth out as soon as possible because they're going to get diseased they're, they're now about all about preserving your teeth but you know to a an industry that's 150 years old all of those fantastic things applied and you know, I see things very common in what Dan was talking about, what I see from accounting practices. And I think we've had, we've had people that help accountants market on here before. You know? The advertising, the website, it's all about them. It's all about what they do, about their values. It's never about you and your problems. And what a difference it makes when you just turn it all around and start talking about the customer's problem and how you're going to fix it. I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, and the, the, the thing that made that whole thing come alive was when um, Dan talked about the way in which, you know, somebody would be walking up to his uh, practice 
and coming through the door and the way in which they would be greeted and made to feel special. That isn't rocket science. No. Just brilliant business. And, you know, if you're doing that on a regular basis, that means that regularly your clients will love you. And if you think about your last trip to the dentist, and mine's in, in the local, uh, in, in my town, it, basically they had, uh, I think they're still there, big screens up because of the China virus. They basically, um, are, 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 I'm going to say virgin on rude. They certainly wouldn't know your name until you've actually been, uh, they, they've said, uh, what's your name? Um, or, or actually what they'll say is, what name is it? And, and actually, that's just the weirdest thing that you could possibly say, isn't it? Oh, I mean, is it absolutely. Well, you, you've got a diary in front of you. Hang on. Yeah. You know who's booked in. Yeah. No. You're male. Well, there's eliminated 50% of the people in the diary. Yeah. You're of a certain age. That's probably eliminated a few more. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they could have a pretty good guess and say, hello, Graham. No, absolutely. And how much better would I feel um, coming in and... and um, Look, even if they got that wrong, it, it's almost that you'd forgive them. But the point, the point is, Dan started with a methodology and has continued building that methodology. In addition to that, he built in the Adam Whitty-esque way his authority and continues to do that. Got me worried, I've got to say, you know, am I missing out on that extra seven years of life because, you know, there's... You know, there's a, there's a bit more flossing that needs to be done. Hmm. So the, 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 there's a huge amount of marketing uh, experience that is shared with us today. Hmm. And, and he's not merely mouthed about it. Yeah. It's and very I, clear. I, as I started talking about those articles he's written for the community newspaper, I started hmm. thinking, well, yeah, actually, if I was going to sit there reading the community newspaper and read the article by the dentist, hmm. That's probably the sort of article I'd want to read, the sort of things he's talking about are the sort of things that would probably interest me. So, yeah. If you're sending a newsletter out every week, and many of us are sending an email newsletter out, mm -hmm. no, we're probably only talking about our products, what offers we've got going on, whatever. Mm -hmm. Actually, change your style. Talk about what's going on in your life, what sort of things have happened, how you've helped people makes a big difference make it blinking well interesting yeah no i i completely agree and um i have to say um he was first of all he he was he's a bit like a find when i when i when i chatted to him in, in orlando but today you've you've had the experience of dr dan walter as well as me and and our listeners have as well he's um um so different from the majority of dentists that you'll ever come across um, and the truth of it is, most of the dentists that are in that middle, mushy middle, doing things that they think are good, but actually are turning off their clients left, right and centre. That's the thing that they need to sit, step back and have a think, well, can we be better? Can we be better for a, a smaller chunk of people? And, you know, you have to look at where he is on the map and literally go over that road. And there's that estate. You know, it's four and a half, seven thousand people. And what did he say that uh, the greater Phoenix area was was uh, uh, covering? Something like four and a million. half million. Four point six million. Now he's not going out. He's he's in Phoenix, but he's not going out and trying to market to four point six million people, not at all. which is not his at all. wider potential audience. Yeah, not at all. He's going out and marketing to seven thousand people in the community across the fence. Absolutely, and 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 you have to say um, that's remarkably well done and it was known in advance so before they uh, put their roots down they'd figured out what they were up against very mm. very clever yeah. so today it's been an absolutely top um uh, uh, uh podcast with dr dan walter from goodyear uh in phoenix um today i've been graham arrowsmith today i've been kevin appleby goodbye goodbye <laughs>